Okay, we're ready to start, Amy. Thank you for your patience and thank you very much for being with us uh, today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it's it's a great, great honor to, to have you here uh, today and to share the space and time with some friends. Um, and my intention to to have this conversation, which is the, the 12th in a series of conversations that we're calling Reimaginar lo Humano or reimagining the human is to expand our mind and our imagination in terms of how we humans can live in relationship to each other and to life as a whole. And, and one big inspiration for that line of, of um, thinking and the example of expanding the mind is, is Francisco Varela. So thank you for being with us. Gonzalo, perdona la interrupción, pero Paulina está muteada y no puede hacer la traducción. Ah, uh, okay, okay. I'm going to solve uh, something. Um, just a second. Gracias, eh, Marcial. So I think now, now it I should I can, work. thank you, Paulina. Yeah? Okay, thank you very much. Great, so, so we tend to start these conversations, I mean, to having a little bit of uh, settling our mind, like I just had one or two minutes of practice, if, if that's good for you. It certainly is good for me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, perfect. I'm going to invite everyone to, to take a comfortable sitting position and we can feel our feet grounded on the floor. We can straighten our spine a little bit and relax our shoulders. And we can take maybe three or four deep breaths. Inhaling through the nose and releasing tensions, preoccupations, whatever needs to be let go of, you can just release. And as we settle our mind using our breath as an anchor to the present moment, let's just take a moment to feel our body, our presence in this space together. And maybe just connect with the intention that brought us here, maybe the intention to learn something new, maybe the intention to connect with a meaning, the meaning of life, and with a view of creating together a better world. a more compassionate, empathic, and wise world for everyone. And gently, we can start opening our eyes connecting with the group. And welcome again, Amy. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for the invitation, Gonzalo. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know Amy, I'm just going to say something briefly about her. 
Amy is the chairperson of the Mind and Life Europe and she is involved with Mind and Life since its inception. She is a clinical psychologist specializing in psychodynamic therapy and philosophy. And Amy studied comparative literature at Brown and Columbia universities before moving to Paris in the early 80s, where she received her degree in clinical psychology at the University of Paris 7, with a specialty in psychodynamic theory and practice, and in parallel, completed a psychoanalytic training. And uh, Amy also was uh, the partner of Francisco Varela, his uh, wife from 1987, I think, around that, that time, till, mm -hmm. until he passed away in May 2001. Right. So uh, one of the, the um, reasons to have this conversation is that it's going to be 20 years since the departure of Francisco and 30 years since the publication of his very influential book uh, who, which was uh, written with uh, Eleanor Roche and Evan Thompson, The Embodied Mind, in Spanish, The Cuerpo Presente. So uh, I guess a lot is going on these days around remembering Francisco. And so I'd like to start us with this conversation, um, simply asking you, how are you thinking about Francisco and his legacy in these days? A lot, first of all, because we have so many activities going on at, at Mind and Life and in other places um, around the world for this celebration. Um, one of the answers to your question is, is that I'm, it's not a new thing, I just didn't learn it, but the, the, the um, reception of his work by young people has been quite amazing. Um, I guess you can't count everything in book sales, but you can um, have a look at a book like The Embodied Mind and see that um, a second edition came out in 2016 and people are still reading it and buying it. And, and, um, and that means that there's an effervescence and interest around what he's doing. Um, in terms of the ideas, the science, the, 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 the influence of his work in the scientific areas, there, you know, there's growth, um, which I guess we can talk about, or there, better I would say that there are people who are taking his ideas as an inspiration um, to lay down paths that are similar, but with their own, you know, with differences in terms of inaction, in terms of neurophenomenology, all of those realms that you, um, you um, know about probably. And um, in terms of the question of legacy, this might be very personal, but I think that the lineage, the scientific lineage that Francisco belonged to, which includes people like Gregory Bateson and Heinz von Förster and, and um, is um, one that we really need to start listening to and developing a relationship with as scientists and also as people, um, because it has its, particularly in these days when we have um, um, really complex difficulties like the pandemic or like the climate change um, because these are ideas that um, that Francisco I think might say don't involve looking for technological fixes that'll come in and kind of swoop down and save us all um, but that demand a real uh, transformation of the way we think about our place in the world mm. um, so um, I'm happy to celebrate his work and to try to um, do what I can at Mind and Life Europe to diffuse this work in that direction. That's sort of my, mm -hmm. my focus, that th this legacy is a legacy of um, uh, ciencia humana, mm -hmm. but not 
in the sense of humanities, in the sense of a real humane science. Mm. And we need that very badly now, don't you think? Definitely. And that brings at the center of the conversation the, the ethics of, of science and, and, and how Francisco approached research in a very peculiar way it seems that he was quite revolutionary since his beginnings in science where he was questioning deeply what what is life and and what is mm -hmm. knowing so what would you say is one of some of his key contributions in how we understand mind and knowing and life i know this is very complex <laughs> question <laughs> but but uh, I have the sense that there, there's there's something in, in his way of working that he approached mind in a very different way to what was established in the cognitive science at the moment. So if you can yes. talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, he, he was an unusual scientist, I think, in that sense. Not that he was the only one, but he was unusual in the sense that... Um, um, he was very aware of the fact that objective science, the classic, uh, what we call computational cognitive science and, and really all objective science is absolutely saturated with the attitudes and subjectivities and valences of the scientists who do the science, except that they don't say it. Mm. Mm. It's sort of behind a screen of objectivity. Um, there are many people, Francisco thought a lot about this. There are many people who write interesting things about this, like um, the names that come, there are many, the names that come to mind are Bruno Latour and, and, and philosophers like Isabel Stengers, um, uh, many, many others. And so um, what, he, what he was interested in doing well, what he was interested in is in the mind that's in life. And so what he was interested mostly in doing was taking that notion that mind or subjectivity or experience or whatever you want to call it is there at the very root of what it is to be a living being, organism, um, and to, to start at that point. And there he started really with Umberto Maturano with the notion of autopoiesis, which um, I think many people have heard of, this idea that a single cell, um, well, it started with the idea of trying to define what is living as opposed to what is not living. What's the difference between a living thing and a machine and a single cell? So the criteria that they came up with for autopoiesis was, was that a, a, a living cell produces all of its components and produces a membrane. And when it needs more, it produces more. It's closed by a membrane. There's a famous term for that, uh, operational closure. Mm -hmm. But that closure is not functional. It's operational. So when the cell is functioning, it's always embedded deeply in relationship with its environment. Mm -hmm. And so from there, what Francisco did, and this he did for a good part of his career, was to look at autonomous systems and to look at the body and the mind and, and to see how they function as autonomous systems. The neural system is an autonomous system. Mm -hmm. The immune system is an autonomous system. And thinking of them as, an auton as autonomous systems gave him the opportunity to see them as knowing systems. Mm. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes one hears related to Francisco, the word cognitive, um, that they're, they're cognitive systems. Um, you could actually almost use the word living and cognitive as synonyms. Mm. And so in that way, um, um, what he did was instead of moving back and looking objectively at what life is, he got in closer mm. and closer to see what life is from within the organism. And this he called the organism centered perspective. Mm. You know, what is it like to be a cell swimming up a sugar gradient? Mm. You know, this, this, this idea. So that's a partial answer. Um, 
you have to tell me the rest of your question. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. It's hard That's with fine. him because with Francisco, yeah. you know, everything's linked. Yeah, there's you know, there's like all these problem. different levels that are linked together. Yeah. Very complex. So, so coming from this idea of the cell being a self-organizing um, organism, mm. um, that is in relationship and embedded in an environment, then we have a leap or that has many logical uh, steps, but there's a leap of this in the scientist itself as someone that cannot be um, separated from the phenomena that exactly. is observing. You know? Exactly. So, so he, I see his work as, as emphasizing this revolution of uh, putting this at the center, uh, the lived experience of the experimenter or the scientist right. in right. getting the phenomena. So. Can you talk a little bit about th this view of the first person approach to research in opposition to a third person approach to research? Well, the objective approach, which is moving back, um, uh, Francisco always said, there's something that always haunts like a ghost, mm. all third person approaches. And that is the question of meaning. And this, I think, is where we bring in at its different stages the question of ethics. Um, so um, when you're thinking about an, an, a system as being um, self-organizing or autonomous and thus embedded in its environment, what it does actually is negotiate with its environment. Um, it takes in things, it excretes things, it, it ha it's perturbed, it, it adapts and ad adapts to these perturbations. Uh, Francisco often called it coping. Mm -hmm. um, this, this coupling, with, he called it structural coupling between an organism and an environment. And um, through that activity, that embedded activity in the world of the organism, um, the, 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 the organism, um, because it chooses out of the world what it is significant to it, it creates what he called a world as opposed to an environment, the world being the subjective world of the organism. Um, it, the organism or the person picks out the salient objects and those become the organism's world, which is very different if, if you were looking at it from the position of an objective observer. If you looked at a cell floating around in, in a Petri dish um, with sugar and water in it, you could see the biochemistry of all that, but we, you'd have no idea of what the meaning mm. was of what was going on. And so that's why he used this nice metaphor that this, this question of meaning is always, is always haunting uh, the third person when it... When it um, when it's, when it's pushed back. So if you think about the idea that, that a self-organizing identity gives forth, gives forth or brings forth, actually actively brings forth the world, um, it's a bit of a jump, but the, there's some steps missing maybe, but you're already in the domain of, now I'm talking more about the organism than the scientists looking at it, but you, you, you're, you're looking, um, you're looking at it, at the phenomenon from the, from the perspective of valence and concern and sentience. And so you have a, um, a meaning making process that is the process of living that then um, endows the world with valence, with affect, with concern, mm -hmm. with, and so, um, so the idea of seeing and uh, seeing a, um, envisaging an organism from the organism-centered perspective from within, um, you're seeing it as a meaning-making um, phenomenon. So that seems to me to be um, already kind of a, an ethical situation in itself. Right. Um, now, an action obviously has to be turned back onto scientists in the way that they do science. That's that's for sure. Do you think that is happening? That the, this this legacy and the the emphasis on the first person approach and the inactive uh, view of, of phenomena is being carried on by other researchers these days. 
20 years after his departure? Oh, yes, yes. Um, I mean, there are many people, there are many people who are influenced by it. Um, um, I'm not sure you could say inaction is something you can apply, but there are many, many people who are um, informed, whose work is informed by, by it. And um, a good number of these people are, um, well, a part of them, a group of them are doing, um, taking up the methodology that's called neurophenomenology. Um, some have taken up this notion of sense making in order to better understand uh, uh, scaled up to a human level what actually happens between people when they interact and there's a whole group of people actually in the Basque country in Spain um, mm. who, are, who are working on a on the notion of what's called participatory sense making mm. which um, um, uses the principles of inaction and has developed the principles in an, of inaction in order to um, ac account for what happens when people interact, something that cognitive science could never do. I mean, Francisco always used to say, um, classical cognitive science um, can code a computer to play chess, mm -hmm. but you can't teach a robot to shake hands properly without making a mistake mm. when it meets an, a human being, for example. So the idea being that our most spontaneous natural know-how is, um, is not comprehensible by the classic techniques of cognitive science. Whereas in action and the notion of sense-making and the way that we live in relationship to the world gives you tools to um, to have a finer understanding of what is actually happening when people are together or in situations, for example, there's some, some good and active work about people who are working with people with different types of um, disabled in different ways. Um, there, there are even inactive philosophers working on relationships with animals and what it means to interact with an animal. Mm. Um, but yes, there are many um, people working in this, in this spirit. Mm -hmm. So um, let's talk a little bit about, about science and Dharma, two words that interacted in Francisco's life. Um, mm. So, so Francisco was mainly was a scientist and he was in a quest to understand reality and what is life and what is cognition, what we can know and how we can know it. And now it's, it seems like a common place to, to, to hear uh, that the Dalai Lama was in dialogue with this and that scientist. But in the eighties or seventies, this was revolutionary to think that you, you can be a serious scientist and bridge the world of science and spirituality, spiritual practice. I know right. that Francisco didn't use that word that much in public, at least he, he was more concerned with understanding human experience, but still he was fundamental in bridging science and contemplative practice. So how, how do you understand his own interest in meditation practice? And tell us a, a little bit about the bridges that he discovered or he created between these two worlds? Yeah, well, um, it's true actually that when, when he started, um, it was very complicated even in the politics and the sociology of science to talk about practice and, and Dharma and, and all of that. That changed very quickly um, through the 90s and into the, into the, um, you know, up till now, it's now perfectly okay. A question would be um, to ask ourselves is if you are studying the brains of meditators, maybe that's more acceptable by scientists mm -hmm. um, than doing the kind of real bridging work that, you know, Francisco and others did in a kind of a, let's say, intercultural dialogue way. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a, that's, a, that's a debate, it's an interesting one. Um, so 
I guess sort of where I want to start is to say that Francisco was an unusual scientist from the very beginning, even before he discovered the Dharma and, and uh, started practicing. And, um, and he really understood science from a really quite a young age as being inseparable from philosophy. So I think probably a lot of people who know Francisco's work have have read some of the things he's written about his own training. He read, you know, phenomenology, Merleau-Ponty, uh, maybe not Husserl, but certainly Merleau-Ponty, very young, um, was trained at, at La, La Católica and at the University of Chile um, in not only phenomenology, but also um, philosophy of science. So he had a capacious sense of things even before he discovered um, meditation, meditation and the Dharma. Um, and he also had, I sometimes wonder when I'm thinking about him, you know, the, you've heard, I'm sure, Gonzalo, the famous story of him, Umberto Maturana has recounted it, Francisco has recounted it, Francisco walks, you know, who's 19, walks into Umberto's office and says, I want to study the psyche of the universe, you know, and um, so uh, he, he he definitely had something in him that was doing Dharma study before he discovered Dharma study. <laughs> that's, yeah. sort of, that's sort of the way that I want to put it is in a is a background. And then I think that um, he he there's there's a number of things and the causality is not is not clear between them but when he started st studying with Chogyam Trumpa, he was it was after the coup d'etat mm -hmm. and there was a lot of distress and a lot of stress and you know um and so th that was definitely in there that his his searching mind that was already searching when he was very young for the psyche and the universe, um, you know, probably went into overdrive when he left Chile and, and, and went to the United States, uh, first to Costa Rica and then to the United States and saw that his entire life was going to be different from the way that he had definitely foreseen it when he was doing his studies, which was, you know, to stay in Chile. So he was suffering. Um, but, and this probably is, is very characteristic of someone like Francisco, when he suffered, he searched even more. Mm. And that's when sure. he found, mm. um, mm. Trumpa. And I, 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 this is an interpretation, but I think that, you know, when he tells the story about meeting Trumpa and he says to Trumpa, what should I do mm. about my suffering? And Trumpa says, well, the first thing you have to do is learn how to do nothing. And he gets a lot of relief from that, um, you know, and, and, um, and I think the interpretation is, is that he, he, he needed to find a space necesitaba where, encontrar un espacio. Way where he was allowed to, mm. that permitted him to, that even uh, prescribed relaxation to him. And then he could continue. And then the other part of the, the, the study of the, the, the meditation part um, is um, that he never stopped, you know, trying to find ways that inroads into understanding his experience. And so he very quickly figured out that this was a, a, a fantastic phenomenology, you know, or a, a, a fantastic inroad for understanding his experiences so um so in terms of bridges between in terms of bridges between science and dharma i mean it's, it's, there's so many there's a lot to talk about and we haven't talked about the dalai lama yet but uh, uh, bef even before the mind and life dialogue started um with this idea of self-organization and autonomous systems i know i went through that very very quickly but it, it um it means that um you have a lot of components 
that are giving rise to, in, a, in an organism that are giving rise um, to a world and giving rise to an identity. And this is, um, and this, and this identity is transient. He always used the example of neurons firing. There's no little guy up there being the orchestra conductor. There's firing, and then there is a, he used to say, woomph, a moment when it is as if there's an identity, and then it passes. And so this notion of, I think he identified this notion of the, the transience of identity as it's an emergent property of self-organizing systems as a kind of sunya, you know, or, or emptiness, emptiness, you know. And, um, and so this notion that he had of mind and consciousness as arising as a emergent property coming from, coming from the body with its components and giving rise to a global phenomenon that would be an identity that then affects the global to local affects what's going on in the body that circularity for him i think um was something that that um when he discovered the concept of emptiness you know probably on one stage of the of the path um he could make a relationship with that in terms of the the emptiness of self um in fact he wrote a beautiful text called the uh, um uh, the organism, a meshwork of selfless selves, in 19, 1991. And um, the other thing, the other bridge that I think he saw, I think it was in seed before he met the Dharma, if I can put it that way, um, was with the beginnings of this notion of inaction and embeddedness, which is really a beautiful example of interdependence. I mean, it's, it's correlative to emptiness, mm -hmm. but um, I guess you could say that emptiness and interdependence are completely correlated, but this notion of inaction as being life as an ongoing practice of relationship between self and world um, with no solid ground, but with a tight interdependence between self and world, world including others, you know, um, seems to me to be a pretty nice bridge. It is. Dharma. Hmm? Yes, no? definitely. And I'm, I'm, I was thinking how such a view, which is an, an understanding of life that I imagine uh, Francisco adopting this this view like he, he i guess he applied to himself what he was discovering of what what it meant to be a living being and a human being so how do you see this view impacted his way of living thinking about him as, as a human being as a person as as a husband as a father as a member of society how how that expressed in his life do you think and I just, uh, when you were asking your question, I was thinking that um, um, he, he was invited to participate in, a, in an art exhibit in Germany at one point. I don't know, you might have seen this. And a group of d different scientists from all over the world were invited to make an installation. So mm -hmm. it was scientists making art installations, scientists mm -hmm. in art class, <laughs> art room. And... Um, he brought in a cushion and then he made a beautiful poster and he caught, he said portable laboratory. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that was, so in a way you're right. He was, um, he was his own lab. Um, and you know, um, the ethical ramifications of that are really strong and quite beautiful. If you think about it, this, this sense of um, science and life and being, being really one thing, Mm -hmm. um and which it which it was um which it was for him on the level of everyday life i think he 
was a wonderful person and a very <laughs> nice person and in many ways and and um, it's hard this kind of question because um because um um he he was on a path like you are and like probably everybody who's listening to us now is you know so um how did it affect him in, in his life it, you know it, it affected him in his life as as a scientist in some very concrete ways because he was interested in any kind of tool possible for getting inside the organism, even when the organism was himself and, and seeing it from the inside out. And so meditation was really um, instrumental um, in that sense. Um, at the same time, um, I think that when he developed the notion of inaction and as he continued working in his practice, um, it became more and more concrete to him that the only kind of biology that he could formulate, biological theories that he could formulate, were theories that were normative, that involved some kind of ethics, which mm -hmm. clearly, you know, an action does. Um, so that was certainly, um, if not an effect of, in relationship to his Dharma practice. Um, and sometimes it posed a problem because he, even though there was a lot of harmony in his way of thinking about um, the, his practice path and his science path, um, there were times when he asked himself whether or not he should just drop the science side. Um, you mentioned to me that you'd been watching some of these films and you saw the interview where he says, you know, science is just a practice, you know, it's, but, you know, it's just a thing you do, you know, and, um, and so there was some conflict sometimes because I think there were moments when he really wanted to completely devote himself to the practice. So, you know, it, it took work to put these things together um, for him. And I think it takes work for everyone. Um, it's a very universal um, problem mm -hmm. for people, particularly with lives like we have, and um, who, you know, you don't go off, not many people can go off on a three month retreat every year, you know. <laughs> Right. So I, I, I'm j jumping around a little bit and maybe I'm avoiding a little bit your question because it's not an easy one to answer in the sense sure. that, um, but I think that, um, that, that he tried all the time to harmonize the practice and, 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 the, and the science and that um, that, that was, um, he was conscientious about it. I mean, when you lived with him, it was something that you could sense that he was very conscious of. It wasn't, um, he was mindful. Thank you, thank you. I, um, thank you for being open to, uh, to answer these questions because I, I feel we're getting to something that is quite, uh, I think, personal too. But I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really curious and I think uh, a life like Francisco's it can be really inspiring for those of us who are looking for paths of integration between what we do in the world as scientists or as therapists or whatever we do and the spiritual path. And um, many people that are watching this interview have their own interest in, uh, in practice. No? And yeah, yesterday when, when I was watching again this quite sensitive interview with Francisco. He was very fragile. His voice was was fragile. His emotions were very easily um, triggered. And what he, I could sense that what he was transmitting about his experience with Tulku Urge and Rinpoche, who he mm. names in this interview as the most important man in his life, Yes, he does. It was very interesting, and the and he shares this very intimate experience of being, of receiving pointing out instructions on the nature of mind, 
and he recognizes what is um, before or beyond phenomena and this mm -hmm. uh, cognizance and luminosity where he says it, it was like a homecoming, like a home, yeah. like, like he, he says, it's like putting my, my head on my grandfather's lap and he really loved his grandfather. It was a very secure place to be around him. So I, I imagine that he had such a, a passion for that life, for that part of his life. Um, so I, I'm so happy that he found a way and well, he created a way basically with his friendship with yeah. Dalai Lama and the continuity of his practice with Sogmini uh, Rinpoche and other teachers that is uh, so astonishing for me that yeah. someone could create such a bridge and do not disintegrate or dissociate or leave it right. leave the, the the science and go to the dharma or or the other way around so i think he he had this capacity of holding a lot of complexity and of course his yes. thinking is bright is brilliant and so precise and even just to listen to his language how he uh, make distinctions that are so precise and subtle. I, I feel that we are facing here a, a very privileged mind and a very noble mind that is want to really wants to serve others through his own search. Anyway, that those are just my thoughts about about this. Mm. Um, tell us a little bit it, about it, it's, yeah. it's also true what I just wanted to say this is also true that um, when you say he held a lot of complexity um, it, it um, in terms of Dharma and science um, and he he uh, tried to create something to bring them together for you know for himself and for others that's absolutely true that he held a lot of complexity this, you've put your finger on something that is actually, I find quite interesting about him is, is that he, um, even when you go back to, to uh, scientific projects like neurophenomenology, which is this idea of bringing the subjective and the objective together. Mm -hmm. And he, he doesn't say we should be more subjective and we should get rid of objective science. He says, it's all in attention a tension mm. um you know and you have to the tension is is being able to hold these things at the same time and this is really the proper of what understanding madhyamaka is about mm. the, the middle path yeah. it's not flopping one way or flopping the other way you know it's staying um in holding this complexity and this tension and i think that you're absolutely right that he had a a, a huge capacity for that Hmm. Tell us a little bit about his uh, relationship with the Dalai Lama and, and your own relationship with the Dalai Lama. Mm -hmm. How did that process unfold? And right. now you are the head of the mind and life in Europe. So it definitely took I, part of your life too. Yeah, I'm awfully lucky because I kind of inherited the, 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 the joy from this relationship that Francisco had with the Dalai Lama it kind of sprinkled down on me once um, Francisco was no longer there. So I'm very, very lucky. Um, they met by chance um, at a meeting. Uh, you may know this story in Alpbach in Austria. And there were, um, there were already, there was a science, um, a science and spirituality meeting because, you know, you said earlier, science and dharma are so separate areas. Such separate areas. In fact, there've always been little pockets of places where people have come together. It's just mm -hmm. mainstream science that hasn't been able to handle putting it together, you know, in in, in spirituality and science. So they met in Alpbach at a science and spirituality meeting where there, there was um, His Holiness. There was the physicist David Bohm. Um, the physicist uh, Fritzjof Capra, um, uh, David Stendhal Rast, who's a um, uh, Catholic priest, um, and a Zen Roshi named uh, Richard Baker, Baker Roshi, who were there together. And I might be missing someone. 
Um, and but in any case, um, they met there and they went to lunch afterwards in this small group because the Dalai Lama in 1983 hadn't gotten a Nobel Prize, so he wasn't famous and you could get close to him. And he and Francisco had a great conversation. And then I think Francisco recounts the story in one of the movies, Franz Reichle's wonderful movies. Um, on the one occasion, the Dalai Lama was coming to France and he was actually invited to speak at the uh, General Assembly, l'Assemblée Générale in Paris. And But he went to Francisco's lab first and they were talking, 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 talking about mind and consciousness and all of that. And finally, the... Um, his holiness's attendants had to come and kind of drag him out there and saying, you know, you can't keep the, uh, the general assembly waiting. Mm. And then he said, we have to meet. Um, and we have to meet in a peaceful place in a calm mm. context. Will you come up to Dharamsala? Wow. You know, so, um, and, and um, so Francisco thought, um, this, this took place over a few years. This was in 83. I think this was more like 85 when finally Dalai Lama had come to Paris and met him again. And Francisco decided that he, he wasn't going to go up to Dharamsala and teach His Holiness science all by himself. So that's how he put together the first meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there's, I think anybody who's been to those meetings when Francisco was alive with his holiness, there was obviously um, something special there between them, like a, a special kind of love affair. Um, the Dalai Lama would laugh and say, um, here's Francisco. Sometimes he puts on his scientist cap, then he puts on his Dharma cap, then he puts on his scientist cap. So <laughs> it was, it, it, and he clearly derives so much joy from, from, uh, from communicating with Francisco. And, and, um, and so there was, I don't, I can't define it, but there, there was love, but I think it was at first sight. Um, and um, so that was how Mind and Life actually started. Um, uh, Francisco had a really, they were private meetings um, starting in 1987 and going up through 2003 when there was the big meeting that was held at M MIT um, called Investigating the Mind, the, the Dalai Lama at MIT. And that was kind of like the coming out of mind and life from being a kind of a private place where the work was done in small groups and no publicity to um, mind and life becoming a bigger, a bigger organization. And by that time, Francisco, you know, had already died in 2003. Uh, I don't know how he would have felt about how things developed, um, but <laughs> we will never know. Mm. But you're keeping part of that work going through Mind and Life. Yes. Can you yes. tell us a, a little bit uh, about what's what's happening with Mind and Life and your work? And yeah. Um, well, um, so Mind and Life Europe is much younger than Mind and Life. Um, mind, the, 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 the mother organization, let's say. So Mind and Life Europe was developed actually at the request of the Dalai Lama. In, it was founded, I think, in 2008 um, because the Dalai Lama um, uh, wanted a, wanted a, thought it would be a good idea to have something for the Europeans, something, an outpost for the Europeans. And, um, and so um, we're now a separate organization. We're sister organizations. Um, and in the beginning, it was administered by Mind and Life Institute. Now it's a European board. I'm, I'm North American, but I've been living in France since a really long time. And, um, and so um, we try to, some of our programs are similar. We have a summer institute, um, a summer school for young people, a lot of orientation towards young people. Um, and, um, and in particular, in Mind and Life Europe, one of the things that we're trying to do, and this addresses the question of uh, that we were discussing earlier about the difficulty of putting together a, a, a contemplative life 
mm. with a with a scientific life or any other kind of worldly life is is that at Mind and Life Europe, we're really developing some programs to try to um, um, work specifically on these difficulties. So we have, besides the Summer Institute, we have biannual, what we call contemplative science retreats, which are really small groups where young people, generally doctoral students, postdocs, young professors, who are trying to work on these difficulties of um, uh, adapting a life to a desire for a practice and doing their work and having their families and all that actually discuss that and work on that in these programs and, and, and um, in these retreat programs. And I'm very excited about that. Um, and um, we're also developing a lot of mentoring programs around, we have an, for neurophenomenology, we have a program of financial awards for people with interesting neurophenomenologically oriented projects. And we're developing a mentoring system so that in this way, people who've received awards and done the projects are mentoring the people who are getting them. So it makes a kind of a virtuous circle of developing people who are interested in the problem the problems, and there are a lot of them in developing a neuro, a truly neurophenomenological experimental situation, um, because it's a complex methodology uh, for science. So we're doing that as well, and um, and we continue to, you know, since the pandemic, we've been producing webinars and doing all sorts of things. It's all on our website. You can have a look. But I'm particularly happy about this development of both the mentoring and looking that instead of just looking to science or looking to practice, looking through these retreats straight in the face of the difficulties, you know, of, of, of putting these things together. Fantastic, fantastic work and, and offerings. And, and we're going to link to the um, events that are happening these days around the, this uh, celebration of Francisco's life and legacy. There's a yeah. wonderful series of, uh, of um, lectures happening, very, very rich discussions about that. So we're going to post that. Um, so Amy, you, as you know, we are going through a difficult time as, a, as a humanity <laughs> these days, not mm -hmm. only because of the multi-systemic crisis that we're facing, but also because of the pandemic. And I'd like to ask you, and I know it's tricky to ask, what, what do you think Francisco would think about this? But let's play mm -hmm. about it because we're just projecting. But what do you think Francisco would think about the, the, the current situation? If you can refer to that and how would, if, what would he say or advise and also, uh, as you're aware, many, many people um, these days are going through sickness, are losing mm -hmm. relatives. And, and I know that uh, the time that you spend caring for Francisco and being with him and during his long sickness was, was very, meaningful, very significant. So can, can you tell us a little bit from your experience of being with a loved one yeah, mm. through sickness and death, what, what did you learn or what, what do you take out of that experience that you could share with us? Well, <clears throat> in terms of the first part of your question, you know, a number of people have asked me this, you know, what do you think Francisco would? And I'm, I'm you know, I can't channel him, unfortunately, <laughs> I wish that I could. But when I was thinking about it at one point when someone asked me, um, I realized that at one of the Mind and Life meetings, um, the early, early meetings, maybe even the first one, he said something that was kind of pertinent to the situation. I, and so it, I, think, I think that what he could possibly, what would seem right for me if, if you know, the, the possibility that he would say this is, is that the virus is just living its life as a virus. 
Um, a virus is the virus is doing what viruses do. You know, it's virus hacen los que hacen los virus. Es un organismo. That the problem is how are we going to um, we as autonomous adaptive organisms learn to cohabit with it mm. something you know more like that but it, it reminds so he wasn't talking about in the in my memory of what he was saying was um um that from the meeting that i was referring to was something like um he said scientists make think of the biosphere as a kind of pyramid mm -hmm. Um, I think it's in the first meeting that he says this, it's, it'd be good to check, um, as a kind of period and we're at the top. Mm -hmm. And all those viruses and bacteria are, are at the bottom, they're, you know, 10 to the, I don't know how, what power more viruses and bacteria than there are people, you mm -hmm. know, creating the, creating the, the biosphere. And, um, and he said, if we're not, he said, what I think he said, what you really should, what we really should do is inverse it. Mm. And all of those bacteria and viruses that actually create the oxygen that we breathe and that make our life habitable on this planet, they should be at the top. Mm. Um, and um, because if we're like this and we continue to degrade the natural world, mm. it's not going to be the ones at the bottom that disappear when we make a mess of things and make a mess of the climate, it's going to be us. And so if we don't care for you know, every single part of the biota or the, 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 the biosphere, then we're cooked. Mm. Which is what's yeah. happening, actually. It, it, it's you know we're really cooked um so um for the question of about caring for someone you know um um it, it's it, it's so singular it's hard to advise um to advise anything and any kind of advice or any kind of um, caring for someone who's dying, um, it's, it, 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 it's, I don't think you can prescribe a series of actions, let's put it that way, <laughs> and I think everybody who's listening probably is aware of that. Um, Francisco was sick for a really, really long time, and I think that that, I mean, he was quite ill starting from about 1994 to the time he died in 2001. So that in itself was kind of a training in impermanence and change and loss. There were times when he had energy, there were times when he didn't, there were times when uh, a couple of times when we thought he was going to die earlier when he had a liver cancer and then when he had the transplant and then so um, I don't want to make it sound too facile, but I do think that um, that really, truly practicing to take um, take in, and whether the practice is on the cushion or whether the practice is in your life with other people, to take in this notion of transience mm -hmm. and of impermanence is probably the best training, um, and. I had that, you know, Francisco and I had that together. Mm. Um, he was, um, we had constant dialogue. We, he used to call it rubbing. <laughs> he said, I need to talk, I need to rub with you. And, and we, every single choice that he made in terms of medical choices, he took as a choice and we discussed as a choice. It was never an imposition. Now I have to do this, now I have to be operated on. So he was very strong about trying to maintain his sense of agency and decision-making capacity in the midst of some extremely difficult and, mm -hmm. and uh, messy health situations. But I think that was a practice also mm -hmm. of um, 
I won't say power, I'll say agency. It's a mm -hmm. much less loaded word. Um, and then at the end, um, and um, uh, this constant dialogue gave, I think, wonderful fruits in the sense that when we knew that he was entering into the final stages of the dying process, that it was a question of days, we discussed what he was, what he felt he was going to need mm -hmm. in order to do this properly. And so I sat there with a pad mm -hmm. and took notes. And he said, you know, there's going to be a moment when I can no longer speak. And so you're going to have to take care of my interactions with the environment. And so this whole dialogue process, I think, allowed him and allowed me to get to this point where, and that is exactly the way it happened. And so um, not everybody is lucky enough. I mean, some people die brutally and some people die um, in the hospital in our situation now with the pandemic where you can't even go to them, which is for me, just the most heartbreaking aspect of this whole situation. But in our, in our situation, I think it was fearless looking in the face of mm. what was coming and coping mm. through dialogue with what we thought we'd need at each stage of the game. And, um, and I don't know, you know, I don't know, other than some kind of training, you know, I don't, you just can't do it automatically, you know, I don't know if this sort of answers your question. Oh, yeah, um, I, I think it's, I'm learning a lot from, from hearing you say this, yeah. the, the idea of keeping a sense of agency of, of, of um, being deliberate mm -hmm. in choosing and not like feeling that you have to go through a funnel that is predetermined by the doctors. Right. And right. I think that right. is so wise. And then to keep the communication open and rubbing and saying and thinking aloud with someone that loves you, what right. what are you needing? I think it, it's it's fantastic to have this, this kind of view uh, because we're all going to go through that process. Yes, we are. <laughs> now, actually, if we are lucky, we're all going to go through that kind of process. If we have, we are lucky enough to to have the awareness to know what we need and have someone who can resonate with uh, yeah. what we're thinking. Yeah. So I think and and right. just to add one more little thing, Gonzalo, to give everyone an idea of, of to the degree to which um, Francisco was a researcher mm. in in the deepest sense of the word researcher. One of our final conversations was on morphine dosages. Uh -huh. So he said, you know, it was morphine patches that he would put, I would put on his neck. And he said, not too much, because I want to be there the whole time. Right. <laughs> but not too little because he was suffering, you know, so he, he would say, cut it in half. Now cut it in a quarter, put on a quarter, put on the other quarter. So that's a very personal detail. But he was um, he was doing research till the, the last second, <laughs> which I just find completely astounding. Yes, it is. So he, he was doing research till his final minutes. Was he was he doing meditation too? Was he also the meditator, the scientist? Was he also meditating <laughs> during the this yeah. uh, part of his life? He was you know, during these last days. Yes. Yeah. During his whole life, you mean, of course he was, but during these last days, um, um, sitting meditation um, until he couldn't anymore, which was up until about 10 days before he died. Um, and, um, but, you know, he lost muscle tone, so he couldn't sit, you know, so he would do, do it lying, you know, lying down. Mm -hmm. Um, during that time, also, the Dalai Lama sent him a message and was on video with him, which was something that was very important to him and to all of us, actually, because Francisco's children were also there. And, um, and 
um, one very, it always makes me smile. It's not a funny story, but in, in terms of that period, which just goes to show that even though it was probably one of the most difficult moments of my life, mm. I can still think of, think of it with sort of awe, mm. you know, and wonder was, was that there were a few lamas and Rinpoches who called him on the phone. Mm. And I think it was Sotni Rinpoche, mm. um, Tukul Urjan was already deceased. Um, okay. I think I think it was Sotni, but he was so weak, he couldn't lift his arm. You know, he could, he was really, you know, it was just a day or two before he actually died. And um, so I would, I put the, I sort of lay down next to him and put the phone to his ear and Sotni said, something i think it was Sophie, but anyway it said congratulations i hear you're dying <laughs> <laughs> and then started giving him instructions about how to do it what to do what to do. and francisco was like glued to the telephone listening uh -huh. to him and um so anyway that's just for the anecdotal side <laughs> of it but yes it, it was it was something yeah that sounds like sogni it he, does sound like <laughs> yeah. mm. someone Francisco really loved and actually I love too. He's a very important person. Amy, we have gone a little bit over time. I'd like to thank you for our time together. Um, thank you so much for your generosity of spirit, sharing with us this story, this view. I know we touch briefly in huge topics but this is yeah. just to open imagination and curiosity of pe of people to go deeper to go and read the books of francisco to look for the documentaries which i also link when i share the videos good, good. they're fantastic uh, franz reich they are they're so franz reich is wonderful yeah he's just a he, and he has a in monte grande the one called monte grande he has a sensitivity to what Francisco's view of life, Francisco's mm -hmm. view of relationship through an action, through mm -hmm. life being embedded in life and mm -hmm. not somewhere out there, you know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, it's quite amazing. Yeah, I really recommend his films. Yeah. And I hope we can have you here in, in Chile after the pandemic at some point. I will be coming. I haven't come in so long and I have to go to Monte Grande and come and see my <laughs> friends in, in uh, in uh, Santiago and Valparaíso, Viña, yes. Excellent. I'll let you know. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so Amy, much. Thank for you so much for your time. Thank you. Deeply appreciate thank it. You. Muy bien. Gracias. Gracias a todos por estar hoy uh, en esta charla. I'm going to finish the translation. Just a second. Uh, I'm going to speak in, in Spanish, Amy, now a little bit. Tú puedes. Gracias. Ok. ¿Tú entiendes? ¿Entiendes sí. español? Ah, qué bueno. Sí. Qué bueno. Bueno, amigos, gracias a los 150, 200 personas que llegaron hoy a acompañarnos en esta conversación. Eh, les agradezco la, el, el juntarse y tener este interés. Creo que es fantástica manera de honrar el legado de un grandísimo grandísimo y creo que necesitamos descubrirlo, redescubrirlo. Eh, se habla poco acá en Chile, ¿no? Se habla más en Europa de, de Francisco que acá en Chile. Creo que necesitamos eh, recuperar su legado y su perspectiva que aún sigue siendo revolucionaria uh, 20 años después de su muerte. Eh, así que muchas gracias por la motivación. Y bueno, estén atentos a los próximos encuentros de reimaginar lo humano. Vamos a tener un encuentro sobre sexualidad y compasión con una sexóloga uh, de Galicia y una otra conversación sobre psicodélicos, conciencia y salud mental con otro investigador chileno que está en Inglaterra. Esos son los próximos diálogos. Así que muchas gracias por vuestro tiempo, vuestro interés y estamos en contacto. Chao, chao. Chao. <risa>